morning I remember it hit me and I got dizzy and my heart started going a little bit too fast and I didn't feel quite right. I came out of this fog, I looked and I didn't see the stop sign or light and there was four or five cars behind me blowing the horn and one guy was coming around the side of me and I, I just didn't know what happened. It's really something you can't explain. You can't explain it to doctors or your family. You can't explain it to anybody. They claim that membrane around their brain was dissolved and they didn't, this is one thing they said, they didn't know how long it would take for it to ever completely grow back or if it ever would. Over 100,000 chemicals are used in American industry. 575 are officially considered dangerous in large doses by the federal government. But no class of chemicals is more subtle or treacherous in its effects than the neurotoxins which can damage the human nervous system even in small doses and cause a variety of behavioral and emotional symptoms. A neurotoxin is anything that is toxic or poisonous to the nervous system. The largest and most widely dispersed groups of neurotoxins are organic solvents. Solvents dissolve fats or greases and other organic materials, so some speculate that solvents are somehow attracted to fatty tissues of the nervous system. Solvents are used heavily in many industries notably electronics, film processing, plastics, textiles, and petroleum. But one of the heaviest users of solvents is the painting industry. Each year, an estimated 450,000 union and non-union painters apply 860 million gallons of paint composed of over 3,000 different chemical and mineral substances. Solvents make up a substantial portion of this paint, some 290 million gallons. Some of the leading researchers of solvent neurotoxicity are at Harvard University in Boston. Dr. Edward Baker heads the Occupational Health Program at the Harvard School of Public Health. And painters are one group that are particularly at risk because of the fact that, that they have often a great deal of difficulty in controlling the amount of ventilation that occurs at the work site since their work may be in one place one week and one place the next. Uh, and this is a group where many studies in this country and abroad have identified significant evidence of uh, toxicity to the brain. It was in Sweden that researchers first identified a condition they labeled chronic painter's syndrome, in which prolonged and repeated exposures to solvents among house painters was found to result in brain size atrophy. In other words, the brains of the painters had actually decreased in volume as a result of their exposures to paint solvents. Those who work with solvents know that they can easily make a person high. Incredibly, some find it humorous, as this Florida newspaper headline shows. Painters are often seen as excessive imbibers of alcohol. Indeed, solvent intoxication and alcohol inebriation share many common characteristics. And unfortunately, some who use solvents find their effects exhilarating, even pleasant, perhaps without even realizing it. They, in a sense, may even become physically addicted to the vapors themselves, in much the same way that a, a person become addicted to alcohol or other drugs. The nervous system gives strong and clear signals when it is getting too much of a neurotoxic substance. A previously unexposed person who enters an atmosphere of solvent vapors will experience some strong initial reactions. These might include eye and nose irritation, lightheadedness, dizziness, the sensation of floating or being high, tingling in the hands and feet, and perhaps headache. It is important to note these signals. It's very important that the person carefully watch for those early symptoms to occur and do something about reducing exposure at that time rather than simply continuing to be re-exposed and having the symptoms go away, which they certainly will after a period of time. Over time, often as long as years, other symptoms develop slowly if the solvent exposure continues. Tremors, lack of coordination, paralysis, impotence, sensory damage, lowered alertness, loss of memory, decreased intellectual functioning, irritability, depression, hallucinations, vomiting, insomnia, narcosis, psychosis, unconsciousness, and death. Those who suffer chronic neurotoxic effects find it difficult to do simple everyday tasks. Failing memory leads some to make notes on everything they do. They may have trouble recalling common facts, such as frequently dialed phone numbers. Chronic and repeated bouts of mental confusion and even brief blackouts can result in frequent errors in activities, such as driving a car, for example. And sometimes the individual may actually find it impossible to perform motor function tasks, such as buttoning and unbuttoning clothing. Tom Pasolacqua was a professional painter for 13 years. A member of IBPAT Local Union 31 in Syracuse, New York, Tom was a prosperous middle-class family man who came home from work to play with his kids, watch TV, and have dinner with his wife, Jacqueline Pasolacqua. 
One day, just two years ago, he came home sick after a day of roller painting epoxy paint in a confined space. He hasn't been the same since. Afterwards, when I talked to him, he explained to me how he felt. And I could actually, you know, smell the fumes, even though he had changed his clothes and everything. And it, it just reeked, you know, of that epoxy fumes. At the end of the day, I was, uh, I don't know if you could explain it as being uh, high or, or my uh, lungs uh, burned. And uh, my kidneys seemed to hurt my lower part of my back. And, uh, and my head was aching quite a bit. He just complained of really feeling lousy and having a bad headache. So I more or less kind of left him alone. Saturday night, I had to go up and go to bed. And I uh, woke up about 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, my head was really pounding really bad. At, uh, I really, I thought it was the end. I don't know if I was uh, dead or alive. He told me what he worked with, but, you know, basically I don't have any, I don't understand about all these paints and things, you know, and the fumes and what they can do to you. And I just knew that he, you know, he didn't feel good. And for Tom to go to a doctor or a hospital or anything, I knew he had to really feel bad. Went back to work Monday morning, which the doctor gave me a slip, told me this, not to work with this material for at least seven days, he told me. Come Thursday of that week, I believe it was Thursday, I didn't feel good again, and I went back to the emergency room. One of the biggest problems was that he didn't know what was going on. He just knew how bad he felt. Um, there was, you know, so many symptoms. Uh, his eyes would burn, you know, and he complained a lot of real bad headaches all the time. I looked around here for six to eight months here in Syracuse and tried to locate doctors before, before it was until uh, I got hooked up with going to Boston. I mean, you know, there was no one that knows anything about it. They thought it was crazy, you know. Before the exposure, you know, he would, like, come home from work and eat and then maybe play with the kids or, you know, just relax and everything. But afterwards, uh, <clears throat> he was very irritable. I know I scream and holler a lot at my wife. Sometimes I, for, you know, no reason at all, really. I mean, I can see it sometimes, but I don't know if it's just that I can't uh, stop hollering or... It got to the point where the boys, you know, were afraid to even get near him, you know, for fear that they would make some noise. Noise seems to bother me. Uh, certain types of noises. Uh, even certain people talking to me, it's, I don't know if it's just the sound of it, uh, it uh, feels like it cracks me sometimes. At first, he, he really actually didn't tell me how bad he really felt. You know, I know he wasn't feeling good, you know. <clears throat> so, it just, it really got to the point where I thought that it would be better if he wasn't even at home. And <clears throat> I think that's when um, Tom called Mr. Ellsworth and explained to him, you know, the problems he was having. I contacted the International. The International, in turn, uh, contacted uh, Tom Pasolacqua, and they, in turn, got him an appointment in Boston at uh, the uh, doctors who are specialists. I was uh, in Boston. They recommended a Dr. Randa Shander in here in Syracuse, who worked with the doctors in uh, Boston. And uh, he sent me to a Dr. Blumetti. This is what she was complaining of. Uh, what the neuro, he's a neuropsychologist. The examination uh, of Tom, which was a rather lengthy one, was pretty consistent with uh, prior evaluations that he had in the Boston area and consistent with the types of data that we've gotten from patients who have had uh, toxic syndromes. Um, he presented with a decrease in terms of visual motor speed and coordination. He had problems with verbal conceptualizing abilities. Uh, he had a very definite uh, state of anxiety, uh, exacerbated by some depressive symptoms. Uh, he was complaining of some head pain. Uh, the neuropsychological evaluation did indicate some very significant fall off in cognitive ability that was dependent upon organic brain function. Specifically, he was having some memory difficulty with both verbal and nonverbal memory, difficulty with sequencing skills, changing set, holding on to complex information. One day I sent him to the store, and the stores aren't that far. And he came back, and he didn't get what I, I think I asked him to buy some bread and milk, and he came back without the bread and milk and couldn't remember what I sent him there for. I don't know if I just go out and I ride around for two, three hours and don't even know where I've been, really. You know, I, I seem to manage to find my way back home, but uh, I've sent to do something specially, to go do something, and 
I'll, I'll forget it. Time went back for a while, and, uh, and uh, he just couldn't make it. You know, he couldn't, he couldn't climb a stepladder because he couldn't keep his balance. And uh, the minute uh, any, anything, uh, any funny smells hit him, like anything that was uh, uh, really uh, potent, you know, he just went he either blacked out or, or just couldn't function. My suspicion is that he'll never be able to go back and work as a painter uh, because of, you know, all the restrictions that he has on him in terms of not being close to solvents or uh, ether or anything like that. Uh, our hope is to get him involved in some type of vocational rehabilitation program, uh, keeping those restrictions in mind and getting him functioning in a different work capacity. I guess what it has done is it has affected my, uh, my nervous system. And uh, I don't know if it's a cognitive part of the brain or something like that, where it's, it's your motor functions in my... Uh, that, that's another problem where... Uh, I just, I, I can't perform with the hands as good as I, uh, as I used to. Plus my memory, I just, uh, I, I get lost uh, very easy now. As a family, we don't go out and do things that, like we used to, you know, just even if it was just to go for a ride in the car, get an ice cream or something like that. Um, <clears throat> once in a while we do go out and um, visit friends that, you know, we have, but not that often. And I feel like there's, uh, sometimes I feel like we are growing apart, and um, it bothers me. They're hoping that, you know, this could all reverse itself within, uh, you know, a couple of years or so. I mean, you know, it's been two years now, but uh, they feel that maybe it could reverse itself. Neurotoxic symptoms are common among painters. There may even be a feeling among some that these symptoms are a natural part of the work. S. Frank Raftery, president of the International Brotherhood of Painters and Allied Trades. And it was just a constant discussion about uh, people having headaches, about uh, you must have worked with something today that didn't agree with you. Uh, they, they knew about lead poisoning and the impact that lead poisoning had on them. And they assumed that some of these thinners and solvents and things that they worked with and shellac, alcohol and things of that nature uh, had this impact on them. But nobody ever thought that anybody could ever do anything about it. So I think that the programs that we have were clearing up some of that. The impact osh Neurotoxic Symptoms Questionnaire is based on the Swedish Questionnaire 16. The questionnaire is used to call the painter's attention to specific symptoms which, if present, may be related to solvent exposure. Impad OSH efforts have also drawn the attention of the national press to the neurotoxic hazards of solvents, and scores of articles on the dangers of paints and solvents have appeared in major papers nationwide. One Rocky Mountain news story features Impat Local 79 member David Friel, yet another victim of toxic organic brain syndrome after 16 years of spray painting. This is David Friel as he appeared on a national cable news Around network here. broadcast in 1980. And, and so basically we went through steps of doctors before they finally come down and said it was like an organic brain syndrome. Local broadcasts also covered the problem. Here, IBPAT member Rick Rimmer of Local 41 describes an episode of acute neurotoxic poisoning he experienced while spray painting city vehicles in Memphis, Tennessee. I was just numb and dead feeling. It just felt like a needle sticking in me all over. I couldn't hear uh, good. I couldn't speak. I couldn't get up, couldn't do anything. Mr. Rimmer was luckier than most his damage was reversible, and his employer corrected the problem by installing proper ventilation and providing a respirator. But throughout America, each and every day, thousands of painters and allied trades workers go to work without these simple, basic protections. The industry is made up of hundreds of small contractors. Paint contractors bid a wide variety of jobs, and therefore use a great variety of paints and solvents, with virtually no hazard data on any of them. All these factors combine to form a significant risk to paint applicators. How great? Neurological disorders are difficult to quantify, but Dr. Irving Selikoff of New York's Mount Sinai Hospital found in a 1975 investigation of union painters that 74% experienced neurotoxic effects from solvents. It is pretty difficult to find a painter who has not had some personal experience with solvent neurotoxicity. If solvent neurotoxicity among painters and others is so widespread, why is more not being done to prevent it? 
One reason is the effects, even when documented in scientific studies, may be difficult to diagnose in an individual. Other diseases or disorders like emphysema, lung cancer, or blood disease can be more readily detected through specific medical tests designed for that purpose. The neurotoxic effects of solvents are much more insidious. Neurotoxins interfere with at least four distinct aspects of central nervous system functions. Memory, visual, motor performance, verbal concept formation, and affect or mood. Different substances affect the nervous system differently, but most solvent neurotoxins alter several of these functions at once. Psychological tests have been adapted by medical doctors and neuropsychologists to detect subtle changes in the nervous system, which frequently occur with solvent exposure. Harvard's Dr. Baker is developing a standardized battery of these neurobehavioral tests to allow comparisons among groups and individuals. Harvard has computerized the tests so they can be given on microcomputers. Scientists say they do not completely understand how specific solvents affect the nervous system on a molecular level, but that solvents routinely cause moderate to severe nervous system damage in those who use them is beyond dispute. And even low doses of certain solvents can have a profound impact on the individual. Now more and more people are concerned that persistent exposure to solvents may lead to a variety of health problems down the road that may have significant impacts on people's lifestyles, their ability to perform their work, and many other activities. Um, one area of concern is that exposure to solvents may accelerate the actual aging process and may cause the brain and other parts of the body to age at a more rapid rate. Uh, we certainly don't understand the aging process very well, but some of the manifestations of premature aging, like memory problems and difficulty concentrating that are associated with certain forms of dementia, are ones that are also associated with uh, excessive exposure to solvents among various studies that have been done in this country as well as in other parts of the world. Kate Osborne had worked as a professional painter for 16 years and was a vigorous, healthy, and attractive 52-year-old grandmother. A member of Painters Local Union 544, she was well known by contractors in Amarillo, Texas as a productive and conscientious employee. All that changed one afternoon as she stripped doors and woodwork in the basement of this local bank. Using a product composed of methylene chloride and toluene, she worked three days with no respirator and only the building's office air system for ventilation. Mrs. Osborne, her boss, and her co-workers were under the impression that this type of ventilation was sufficient to remove solvent vapors from her work area. Kate Osborne, as she appears today, transformed, old before her time, an apparent condition of pre-senile dementia which she squarely attributes to her exposure to paint stripper that day. You can't explain it to anybody. It's just something that happens to you that it just didn't real. You just feel like you have died and woke up into a whole new world. It, you're just a different person. My own daughter didn't even recognize me after two months. She said, Mother, I've never seen anybody change so much. She said, I didn't even recognize you. She had pretty dark auburn hair and was just real pretty. And about four or five months after that, my mom was gray. And it was just... She was wrinkled, and I loved her anyway. <laughs> I always loved my mom. But people didn't recognize her, and you could tell mom was real embarrassed. We'd go places, and people wouldn't realize that it was my mom, the same person they'd seen five or six months earlier, was not really the same person. Kate worked for me over a period of about uh, five or six years, and uh, uh, was real well thought of, not only uh, uh, by myself, but the whole crew. He hired her, and Boy, he was just tickled to death. Then the other contractors tried to hire her out from under him, all of them, because they still want her <laughs> right today, Mike. And her job's awaiting if she could ever go back to business, but I don't think she ever will. She'll probably never be able to do it again, but she's done it, and I'm proud of her. And at times, I really do feel sorry for her, because I know that when I mention the fact that I saw Mike or something, she gets real depressed because she can't do it anymore. She was always... Uh, thinking up things on her own and uh, like the fireplace here she took mirrors and all of that and broke them with hammers and put them on this fire she's decorative we've got wainscot here in the house and the in houses that she has done that's simply out of this world this was before she got sick boy she put all her heart and soul into it i mean she loved that kind of business i was uh, stripping doors and woodwork uh, and uh, so we could refinish them and uh, about the third day, it was in the afternoon, well, my hands and mouth started getting numb. And I thought that uh, 
you know, it would go away. Usually when you're in lacquer, you go outside and it'll go away, but it didn't. It just kept getting worse. And then that night when I came home, I was lying on the couch and I was real sick. The next morning I knew I had to get someplace, so I got up and I got in the car and I took off and things were coming toward me. I kept dodging people. I thought that everybody on the expressway was going to run over me. I received a call from uh, one of the staff at the hospital in the emergency room and they asked me if I knew uh, Kate Osborne and I told them yes that she was an employee of mine and they uh, said well that she had checked herself into the emergency room and was uh, uh, that they couldn't get a whole lot out of her that she was just nearly incoherent uh, and uh, that they were able to get out of her that she worked for me. I got a little better in about a week they released me and let me come home and uh, then one evening my husband came in he found me crawling around over the floor looking at just crawling all over the house and he he wanted what I was doing I told him I was looking for my clothes and uh, so he rushed me out to the hot doctor's office. I know it's so scared my life she just acted like a crazy person you know she didn't know what she was doing and she didn't know where she is at. My brain was just drifting away. I just felt like a crazy person. And my mouth was all numb. And But the main thing was just the, the crazy, weird feeling that I had, which I still have a lot. It was just like I was in another world. It wasn't real anymore. As the weeks went on, I noticed that my mom was getting older. She was getting more tired. She was more irritable. I could, we would get in arguments where my mom and I have always been able to talk things out. Mom would just break down and cry for hours and hours and hours. And I realized then what had happened, that it wasn't just something that was made up and that she had been to all the doctors and everything and that it was real. It wasn't, it wasn't a fairy tale like I wanted to make myself believe. I probably haven't seen her now for a year, this being the first time in probably a year that I've seen her. and. Uh, but she, she definitely has aged quite considerably. I think she told me she had about seven doctors down there that was chemical specialists, you know, and they're the ones that found this stuff. And uh, that's how they come up with it. Had to be the chemicals, and they claim that membrane around her brain was dissolved, and they didn't. This is one thing they said they didn't know how long it would take for it to ever completely grow back or if it ever would. So therefore, any time she gets around certain chemicals, it does something to that membrane up there and she, she's not even the same woman, you know. I can mention things now to mom and she'll say, why? You know, she doesn't remember things. And that really bothers me because my mom is always so intelligent and so smart and so quick and very quick-witted and she's getting slow now. And it's not because of her age because mom's I mean, she should still be young. I mean, 51, 56 in there, that's not old. It's not old at all, but to look at my mom and, and uh, the things that she thinks and the things that she feels now, you would think she's probably in her 80s. I know I don't look too young, but this rather, happened rather overnight. My hair turned white and I started drawing up. Well, when I got the stuff before, it was something I didn't explain, one side of my face all drew up and yeah, I look like some kind of a freak and I still feel like I'm wearing a mask. Any painter that's, uh, that does any painting that really knows the painting business, they, they're going to have to learn to strip doors and windows and take paint off cabinets and furniture and everything else, you know. Everybody in the paint business has had periods when uh, in certain instances have uh, inhale more fumes than what they would normally do on, on a job and uh, would uh, uh, get depressed or, or down and uh, uh, under the weather. You start feeling crazy, your fingers are numb, your mouth especially, your lips. Your lips will start getting numb. You never dreamed, you know, you thought, well, the minute you went outside and got air, well, you'd be fine. Each one of us definitely tries to protect ourselves the best that we can and uh, uh, provide the best conditions that we can for applying products, but it, it's not always practical. Uh, I do think that uh, us as field applicators just need more information on uh, the consequences of using some of the products that we're exposed to today. The chemist that checked this stuff 
and everything. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's in there that they ain't even got on the label. They've got a substitute name for it and uh, a lot of that, and uh, uh, most of it just says proper ventilation. Well, uh, you'd take an old dumb boy that didn't know what proper ventilation was, he'd really be in trouble. He, he could kill himself. Who knows what's adequate? You don't know if they mean outside or or what. It, it didn't explain to people that way. It said work with adequate ventilation, and I figured I had adequate ventilation as large a room as it was. She was a conscientious worker, and she would... Uh, she was just like each one of us that are in the trade. We, we all try to protect ourselves as best we can, and, and Kate was no exception. Painters must recognize the acute and chronic symptoms of solvent neurotoxicity. Persistent evaluation by the individual of acute symptomatology is important to prevent either significant overexposure while it's happening or cumulative damage to the brain in the long term. Even though the acute symptoms may go away, the chronic effects, the damage to the brain and peripheral nervous system may occur and persist in the absence of those acute warning signals that occur early on. This really emphasizes to me the importance of detecting those early symptoms at a time when the person is still sensitive to them and is noticing them with, with an appropriate frequency rather than after the fact when they're starting to ignore those early signals and then may be developing more evidence of chronic uh, irreversible damage. The technology for controlling solvent vapors exists and should be used to prevent those neurotoxic symptoms altogether. Mr. Al Stein is the owner of United Painting Incorporated, one of the very largest painting contracting businesses in the United States. When we put a man to work years ago in a dusty area or an area that was full of fumes, that man had to stop at least once every half hour to an hour for 10 or 15 minutes to sort of get to himself again. And sometimes he didn't come to work the next day. So not only did we have a loss of productivity, but we had a, a loss of, uh, of, uh, of actual work or, and his availability. We then started with the dust mass years and years ago, uh, sort of to uh, keep the dust away from the man and also maybe reduce the odors a little bit. And we found them the efficiency grew a little, but then as we went on into years, we found that without the mass, we can't work. And there is absolutely no uh, productivity. Especially today, uh, you have uh, paints and coatings that have uh, uh, high toxic odors like MEKs, methyl ethyl ketones, and the uh, cellosols, and they're very strong. When we introduced the air-fed mass, the type I'm talking about, the one that has its self-contained canister, all the men wanted them. And since they're extremely expensive, like three, four hundred dollars a piece, we were sort of reluctant to give it to them because, you know, they would walk away with them. Things happen to have that. Things sometimes walk away on jobs. So now every one of them were, was willing to have us hold back from his pay between fifty and a hundred dollars to prove to us that he would return the mask in good condition if we would give, if we would issue one to him. And we have now been issuing masks to all these men, and they, they have. They have moved toward the expensive air-fed mask rather than the uh, single manual cartridge or the double manual cartridge or the dust mask because they feel more comfortable and they are, more, they are cooler, their eyes aren't fogged, and they're just working easier. And we have found that the increase, the increase in production, that is, with the safety equipment, with breathing equipment, is unbelievable, almost in many times, double or more. Scientific research and education of painters and consumers raise other issues, such as better testing of products before their introduction on the market, and more complete product labeling. The label Kate Osborne read before she started stripping paint in that bank basement said, use with adequate ventilation. How does the product user know what is adequate ventilation? Other labels add warnings about proper respiratory protection. But there are many different types of respirators and some are useless for solvent vapors. Better product labeling is found in some other countries, most notably Scandinavia. In the U.S., the Painters and Allied Trades Union, IBPAT, has developed a computerized hazard index program and solvent database for painters, contractors, and others to use to calculate solvent concentrations before painting begins. IBPAT has developed one method to assign ventilation requirements in cubic feet of air, which could appear on every paint product label. 
The program also computes fan sizes and flow rates and selects proper respirators, including specific model numbers, instantaneously. Larry Thomas is executive director of the National Paint and Coatings Association, a Washington, D.C.-based trade association representing manufacturing companies which produce 90% of paint and coatings made in the U.S. The NPCA has also developed a labeling system called HMIS. Let me point out a, just a couple of things about our hazardous materials identification system. I think if I refer to this chart, which is utilized as a part of the system, you can see how easy it is both for the manufacturer and the worker to understand and utilize this system. For example, a hazard index, a simple numerical system where hazards are rated from zero, being a minimal hazard, up to a four, a severe hazard. And over here, under the personal protection index, you can see by the ABCs, the kinds of equipment that one would utilize in order to protect against a particular hazard. It's a system that through a simple, understandable method advises workers as to what kinds of protective equipment they should use in the workplaces in areas where they may be exposed to chemicals in manufacturing paints. Now, in addition to that, each worker can carry with him a wallet card which again explains the hazard ratings as well as the letter identification of the kind of protective equipment which should be used. We're very proud of this system. We think it's innovative. We think it's based on logic and common sense. And we think it's a system that can really go far in helping to provide a safe workplace. It takes a while to develop a system of this nature. There's a lot involved in terms of rating the chemicals. It takes a while to get acceptance of an innovative system of this sort, especially when some manufacturers may be utilizing a different system and it requires changes in their own operations. We do endorse the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's coming out with a sensible federal rule in this area, and we think that will operate as an added impetus for the development of our own program. The brain and central nervous system are probably the single most precious part of the human organism. Our brains house most of our personalities and nearly all of our subjective experience. When the brain is affected by chemical neurotoxins, the very essence of the individual may be severely altered. We're now learning more about solvent toxicity as a result of recent research, but if many individuals who are exposed to solvents chronically were to go and ask their personal physician, what should I do? as a result of being exposed to toluene every day, I think many physicians would be hard pressed to know what kinds of signs or symptoms to look for or how to evaluate them medically given that knowledge. So for that reason, we feel it's particularly important for individuals who are exposed to become familiar with some of the toxic manifestations of exposure to solvents. Even if it only happens once in a while, it, it might be a signal that there, you know, is something wrong that, that not, <clears throat> All painters are, uh, will get these symptoms just because of one exposure, but they could build up over the years. You could taste it in your throat and like that, but uh, and you might get a slight, you know, well, head feel light. You might get a, s a slight headache or something like you'd been on, a, like you'd been drinking heavy or something. Within a period of 15 minutes driving on the way home, I'd get tired and like want to fall asleep. I notice when I work with oh, solvent paints that I seem like I get more. I get a headache. You're just laughing and a cutting up and a blowing and a going, and the first thing you know, you're laying in the floor and you you don't know nothing. Somebody dragged you outside. More of a high, and you lose uh, some of your consciousness. Uh, you tend to uh, lose balance. It can make you rather sick at your stomach, and you get this sick feeling. Today's workers, employers, manufacturers, and consumers face an increasing daily danger to health when overexposure to solvents occurs. What each person decides to do about it, how much importance is placed on the problem by all of us, ultimately will decide the fate of people just like these.